This is the Wisconsin Lighting Lab Willcast. My name is Adam Rupp, and my guest today is Joe with a company called Synapse. Uh, Synapse is a, a smart lighting controls company, an industrial IoT company. Um, Joe, let's start out. Just give me a few background details on Synapse and your involvement in the controls business. Sure. So Synapse is a Huntsville, Alabama-based company founded in uh, 1997, a consulting firm basically that took a Zigbee application, um, Took them six months to figure out how to turn a light off and on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so from there they decided there's got to be a better mousetrap, yep. and they wrote some application software that sits on top of the Zigbee stack. So, the things that are the good pieces of Zigbee that um, for mesh yep. technology were brought out, and <clears throat> we supplied the kind of the buttons and the hooks to e make the network easy. So when you power power the device on. It is, it's a, a native mesh network uh, where the nodes are talking to each other based on signal strength. So it's not necessarily a competitor to Zigbee, it's, it's working in conjunction with the Zigbee technology. Right, really. Our IP is, is the software that currently sits on a Zigbee stack, but could be ported to any type of other um, standard like Thread or LoRa. So for us, the use cases with Zigbee are, are great because it gives us enough data bandwidth, hmm. um, enough distance, and the speeds are, are significant enough that we can do uh, more than just lighting applications. So why mesh technology? So what, I guess, to what's mesh technology 101 and what are, what are the yeah. competing kind of communications sure, options? Right. Yeah, and, and mesh native is, native mesh to us for Snap, for our Snap OS is something that we do, uh, um, but you can do a star network, you can do other, other, other network um, configurations with Zigbee. Um, for us, mesh, especially in large scale deployments, where um, you're, you know, one, you want to save power. A lot of our applications are battery powered. Um, you don't want the nodes uh, transmitting great distances all the time. So the mesh uh, has gives you the opportunity to talk node to node, point to point, light to light. Um, so there's really a lot of traffic through the network. There's no bottleneck in the communications Correct. network. So if you had, Correct. for instance, say a baseball stadium and there were 400 fixtures around more or less a circle, every single fixture would be able to relay the communication. Correct. Okay. Right. Cool. Each, each device has its own microprocessor, its own smarts, and um, it can pick its own route based on signal strength. So that's why we're kind of fond of mesh. And for lighting, of course, it's a, it's a natural because most of your fixtures are on the same plane or in the same area and you can push out software uh, very easily through the mesh. So what are the competing standards with Zigbee? I, I know in the lighting industry there's been a lot of debate the last sure. decade or so. You know, What is going to be the standard that people can build their controls platforms off of? Beyond Zigbee, Zigbee what are the options? Yeah, so you have uh, you know, Bluetooth, of course, uh, Bluetooth, uh, BLE, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, Thread was a standard as well, uh, which uh, and some LoRa-based uh, um, applications, which are all you know, I, they're all standards that you can write to. Mm -hmm. um, at their, the, where everybody gets nervous is well, we're talking wireless. So what else is out there that's running on those standards and in my facility, uh, and then also you know get into security questions as well. Um, for us, we picked Zigbee. That's the thing we started with. Uh, we have a lot of applications that are non-lighting, non-industrial, where we, we, we sell that, our radio device with our software loaded, and customers can write their own applications to it. So it's, it's been battle-tested. Um, you know, there's limitations with Zigbee. You can't push video over it, which you get a lot of people in lighting uh, street controllers that want uh, video, of course. Um, but for controls and device management, uh, there's enough bandwidth on that, on Zigbee, that it's... It's a, been a popular choice for us. Cool. Yeah. So within the application space, I know you guys advertise your industrial IoT mm -hmm. capabilities and then smart lighting, but it sounds like there are other legs to that product stool. There could be <laughs> our, you know, agricultural products. You know, what is kind of the full range of, of the applications you guys work on? Yeah, for, for Synapse in general, we have basically three vertical markets. The one we started with, which is what we call, and what I'm responsible for is our car, core IoT development platform where we basically sell our, our Snap OS, which is our IP, to developers and uh, inventors that want to uh, integrate uh, and make sensors smart or any type of device smart. We've done, <laughs> we've made, bad, uh, uh, we've sold to people who have made tags for people that are moving you know, <laughs> throughout a hospital uh, to you know, make sure they're washing their hands when they're entering a you know, room and out. 
Uh, our, our largest application is smart agriculture where they're monitoring for pests in um, hard fruit orchards, uh, nut orchards and fruit orchards. And that once you have that data highway um, that, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of acres, now you can produce, uh, you know, you can, do, you can bring back other information and basically put a weather station in, in every, every acre that you need. So you go from monitoring to now controlling. So you can turn pumps on and, you know, frost warning, you get advanced frost warnings and turn irrigation pumps on and shut things down if you have an, some issue in the, in the field um, or a pest, which was the original um, uh, application was to, to, to have a um, pesticide free pest control. Hmm. And um, you can, you know, obviously spray for uh, spray in the fields and, you know, it's, it's really interesting applications. We That's do awesome. A lot of, yeah. We also have guys that are doing motor monitoring, uh, both um, new motors and then also retrofits in the market. So, so the applications are really endless. Um, I like the, the data highway term. Yes. So in, in reality, you guys are, are the, uh, the data highway in between the sensors and the machines and whatever is being outputted. Correct. Or, and from a building management software or, a, you know, com- computerized control of everything. Right. So do you guys do application development kind of, um, you know, downstream of the, the, the wireless standard and the, the sensors? Or I know you have an online interface that, that we've worked with, but do you get into the software side of it at all? Uh, for, our, for our lighting and our industrial IoT verticals, we do. Okay. Um, so lighting, uh, as you know, we have, uh, we, our original Simply Snap software was built to be a um, on-prem standalone system because of, you know, concerns with internet security, uh, with being devices plugged into the internet. Um, but we, we do have a cloud ver- platform version of that too, which ties into our industrial IoT where we're trying to <laughs> use that super highway of lighting controls. You know, we, <laughs> got, we have uh, thousands of lights inside a, a warehouse and we want to get information from uh, devices on the floor, um, motors, pumps, um, you could do sub metering and then backhaul that data. So where the software comes in at the back end is you can't do everything on a gateway. You have to be connected to the cloud in order to do the real analytics and bring value to the data that you're pulling in. So that's where we do a lot of cloud software work. Cool. Yeah. And in industrial IOT specific, it seemed like a lot of the stuff is around production inventory management. Is that, do you guys use computer vision for inventory monitoring or what do, what, what, are the, what does that sensor suite look like? Uh, so a lot of the sensors are, are uh, you know, temperature, pressure, weight, um, uh, you know, vibration. Okay. Uh, so it's taking basic sensors that are off the, self, uh, off the shelf sensors and making them smart just by adding a battery powered node and tying, you know, four to 20 milliamp output to our system and bring it back hauling it just like we would interface to a lighting driver. And then that data can be, can be pulled every 15 minutes or it can be an event driven. If there is an issue, you can get, you know, an email alert, a text alert, or you, the system can automatically over, over, override it and, and turn something off. And what's the ultimate goal of the, the building manager, the facility manager? Is it, is it, controlling inventory levels but what's the end result of, of all this is it is it production throughput yeah, that's a great question <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i guess the, the, the we're sky's still, the limit yeah, we're, yeah. we're still trying to figure okay. that out you know what's the data worth and and you know who's willing to pay for the data but yeah so you know i can speak for our parent company which is industrial pipe manufacturing and you know makes everything um in the in the municipal water supply basically uh, so their their concerns are you know inventory waste, uh, high carrying costs of powders that are used in uh, fire extinguishers, um, airflow loss that's a big one. Hmm. Uh, so extra compressors that they have to pay for, uh, inventory management. You know we have uh, weights on carts for uh, material that's going through a process. All that adds up to extra inventory costs. Um, you know some of it might just be asset tracking. You know where is a Where's a fork truck? We've been, rent- <laughs> We've been renting for yeah. two years. Uh, now the lease is up and we can't even find it. Those, yeah. yeah. So it's, it, the sky's the limit really. Yeah. I was on a, a vendor kind of vendor visit trip recently and it's a huge, huge uh, manufacturing company, you know, hundreds and thousands of acres of, and they, 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 they actually manage a lot of their inventory outdoors mm-hmm. and they were trying to come up with some type of a system to track inventory. Cause in, in some cases, You'd have to go. What's the equivalent of 20 city blocks to get to the inventory? Right. And you know they couldn't find it. 
So it would actually produce, it'd be easier to produce new product than it would be to find the inventory. So I can certainly see the, the benefits of those types of capa capabilities. Yes, yeah, so we actually, uh, you know, speaking of the, the core product, we have a guy that actually developed his own asset tracking system with our Snap uh, products. So, hmm. and that was the, the reason he was at a, a very large manufacturing facility and the story about the missing the fork truck that was leased for two years. That was, it's a real was, story. That, that's a real, that's story. a real thing. Yeah. So, so it really depends on what they're, they're looking for. A lot of it is just, you know, with the, the incentives from the utility companies, it's yep. just power monitoring and getting reporting so that you can get energy rebates uh, and then smart use of your, your energy, of course. So in the fork truck situation, was it a GPS tracker of some kind or was there, how is, or is it more or less just something to connect with your, your data highway yeah, to know so exactly where it was on the facility? Exactly. Okay. So he wrote his own application software and his own user interface based on the equipment. You barcode scan that, that fork truck. And that tells you all your OSHA security things as well as the guy <laughs> have clearance to run it. And then, you know, basically he set up uh, repeater pings throughout the facility, which is uh, one of the largest facilities under cover and under one roof next to the Pentagon. And it's, you know, he's, his accuracy was within six feet just Man. based on signal strength. So that's yeah, wild. That's really good. Yeah. And then on the compressed air side, was, would that be like a pressure sensor? That then connects to your data highway? It's an actual airflow sensor. Airflow sensor. Yeah. Okay. So basically the plant would uh, put those in uh, throughout their process and check for air leaks using those airflow sensors, you know, having a, a, a baseline of knowing what the pressure should be at those at those areas and they could detect leaks and get those fixed. Hmm. Yeah. So you said you can't send video data right. through your network. We, we've... Uh, we're in the early stages of looking into using some computer vision for data data analytics on mm -hmm. various applications and you know the basic idea is you get a camera you know 10 20 30 50 feet in the air on a light pole you can do a lot of stuff with that yeah, absolutely but uh, so what type of network is it is it you said it's a frequency bandwidth issue but what type of technology would re would, would be required in that case for video uh, you would definitely want power over ethernet with Wi-Fi or you know Wi-Fi could certainly handle that. Uh, video requirement um, and, and and for that we have customers that integrate uh, lighting controls they have their own system that are doing video and sound and and um, architectural lighting for basically city streetscape sure. uh, lighting and they have all that technology and what they'll do is they'll use their technology uh, four or five different RF devices uh, on those poles and then in the surrounding areas they'll use our network and then tie the two together via API. So the customer only sees one interface. So hmm. they use the lower cost control function for the, for the, you know, the, I wouldn't call them dumb poles, but the, the <laughs> ones that aren't, you know, lighting up the city street and, you know, which might be a couple hundred poles. And then there may be a thousand poles around the, the area that still want, con they will still want controls and, and data management from, and then we'll use our network and tie them together into one dashboard. So it's possible. And, and on the, the lighting topic, which is our business, right. um, sports lighting. And uh, I know you guys um, do a lot of sports lighting controls. What are, what are customers, what are end users trying to accomplish with sports lighting? I know it's one of those situations where the sky is the limit in terms of what can be done. But if you had to kind of 80-20 it and narrow it down to the things that provide the most value for you know, the, the best cost architecture, right. what do you think people are after? Well, I mean, it really depends on the end user and the application. Obviously, the small municipalities care about not having power on when it shouldn't be on or having a guy there or having coaches and players with access to the lighting controls yep. all the time. So for them, it might, you know, for city parks department, it may be we want to we want to be able to set schedules, turn lights on and off remotely so we don't have to have a send a guy out every time someone wants to use the field. Uh, we want to have practice settings we want to have game time settings um, so there's a lot of that in the municipalities when you get up into the you know the larger scale division one and and pros then it's it's more you know flash they want yeah. to see more light you know, shows light shows yeah. and yeah and so you know there's there's it really depends on the application um, our system we try to tend to make it flexible enough to handle handle both um, and it's we have a very simple user interface so that, you know, and you could set different management um, administration levels on it so they can, you can have the coach be the user and, you know, the city plant manager or the city manager being the, the administrator in it. So, 
but I would say most of the time it's it's main, mainly it's switch, schedules. It's switching and, yeah. and schedules. Yeah, yeah. Fe- definitely. And we we kind of see the same thing, and uh, you know we've got some larger scale applications where they want the you know want the want the fancy light shows, but like you said, a lot of it comes down to if you're going to be paying and investing in a, in a solution that limits energy, let's make sure it's not turned on. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> the main more thing. Than it needs right, to. right, yeah. right. Uh, so you mentioned power monitoring, mm-hmm. and this is something that we're, we're taking a close look at right now. Uh, you know, solid state electronics are more susceptible to power issues than some of the legacy lighting technologies. Right. And when you say power monitoring, is it energy usage? Or are you guys actually looking at voltage transients and other types of, you know, dirty power issues? Yeah, for us, it's more energy, energy. usage. Yeah, okay. reporting for, you know, to meet DLC specifications or Title 24 you know, DLC 5.0 is coming out next year, and I think power monitoring will probably be a requirement the way it looks. Um, so it's for us, it's just it's energy reporting. Okay. Yeah. And on the support side, I know you guys have uh, commissioning services. Mm-hmm. You have ongoing, uh, do, you have, do you have service contracts or service models, or what, what does that sales process typically look sure. like for a, a sports lighting application? Yeah, honestly, it really depends on the, the lighting OEM. Yep. Uh, they have their choice. Um, some people... <laughs> just want to sell lights and not be a controls company. Sure. So they, you know, call Synapse they want, for all your, yeah, call your that, yeah. Synapse for, every, for all your <laughs> They give them your cell phone number, yeah. right? <laughs> so that's exactly. So some people actually want to run it as part of their value added services. Yep. And that's certainly an option. We have, we have a remote access where we host uh, the cloud where, where, you know, for an annual contract fee, you could have up to 50 of your sites being monitored and then you can parse those off individually as, as you see fit. Um, we can do it that way, or we certainly, if you know, you just hand us over the the end user and give them our 800 number, they can contract that service with us, or they can run it behind their own um, VPN and run it on their own network. So, know. so when issues or you know when, when troubleshooting situations come up, what are oftentimes the reasons behind it? Is it uh, <laughs> is it an educational? component where the you know the the end user was potentially sold a really cool product and they weren't educated on it or what what do you guys see come up as the main pain points um you know a lot of it it stems from you know who's installing it who who is putting the map together who's getting the floor plan together um you know we have a thing called the census that goes out and you know finds all the all the radios that are in that area for that application and pulls them onto the onto the map but if Nobody's really laid out the map with a with a proper you know map uh, Mac IDs so where where are these things located? Then it becomes kind of hard to build out that map. It's easy to control, but you really the end user typically wants to know where you know make sure the lights are in the location that you say you are on the map, and then you can set schedules and zones based on that. So after initial startup. We really don't see a lot of issues other mm-hmm. than a guy forgot his login password. Or, <laughs> you know. The help desk. Oh, the help, help desk, desk. Help yeah. desk call. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I know it's interesting. We work um, work with a lot of contractors, you know, electrical professionals, and uh, you know, I think there's there's a bit of a lag in knowledge and training where you know your traditional journeyman or, or contractor they're they're very very good at um, you know traditional products with the you know they you hooking up, you know, basic products into their electrical systems, do a right. phenomenal job at that. But it's almost like there needs to be a, a separate skill set where it's Joe the contractor meets Geek Squad. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I've always wondered with, you know, larger industrial facilities, uh, you know, do you guys work with their IT department more so than their uh, building and maintenance department? You have or to. You have I, to, I tell yeah. the story all the time. I, I've walked into projects to go in and commission them and... Uh, the IT guy had no idea this was even going on and that there was another going to be another network running on and everything just comes to a screeching halt. So you, you have to yeah. make sure you keep those guys involved from the front end. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then your, to your point to contractors and electrical, the, the other biggest thing we see is missing antennas or antennas <laughs> mounted to, you know, in the wrong spot or not, you know, not connected. That's so those little things that we need to do a better job educating before things go get into the you know installed in the field and we go out for commissioning those are usually it's a little bit of hiccups but yeah it is a critical one they they can they can stop the presses real quick yeah and you know in the it world a lot of this is i don't want to say it's old news but it's it's already part of that skill set right so that's you know i think a uh you know a fusion of both of those skill sets are needed and from a from a 
a cl- compliance standpoint or a national electrical, electrical code standpoint, who are the folks that have to install these products? Do they have to be a licensed electrical contractor or can the IT department in the long run manage this silo? Uh, no, I mean, typically, it's going to be a, a licensed electrician, yep. either a plant electrician or, you know, if you're selling through the energy services market, usually they have local electricians that are, that are doing the install. Um, from a commissioning standpoint, certainly it can be the, it can be the IT guy. Okay. But from the, the physical installation, yeah, it's typically an uh, electrician. Okay. Yeah. So the future of IoT, um, you know, this, the, the IoT, AI, computer vision, there's such, <laughs> you know, 5G, these are all, there's a lot of buzzwords involved here. Yes. And every time I read about things or I watch YouTube videos on, you know, how this big I- I- IoT wave is coming, then I say, well, on the commercial industrial side, this stuff's been around for a long time. Yeah. You look at automated manufacturing, robotics, you know, things that you guys are doing. It's interesting how there's a there's a disconnect between, you know, the, the, the past and the future. And I'm sure on the industrial th- side, things will continue to get better. But do you just see it as there's a lag in the retail space or the residential space with the technologies you guys are already deploying? Or is it indeed a new a new technology on the kind of the retail end market side of things could be built, you know, home, you know, home building, you know, everything from digital thermostats to, right. uh, you know, I've, you know, I read about refrigerators that can, you know, more or less send you a notification that you need to replenish your tomatoes. <laughs> but <laughs> right. do you, is, it, is it the same stuff in a new application or are there new standards and technologies being developed? Yeah, that, that's a great point. And I'm uh, sure it's a combination uh, of both. It, well, yeah, I mean, I would say the home consumer market is, is way ahead of, well, you know, the, in, the industrial. Is it really? Oh, for sure. You know, I mean, you think about it, uh, you know, your, your phone, you know, has how, how many different radios and you can connect to anything from anywhere really already with it. So the, the home thermostats, the, the Philips view lighting, you know, the multicolored lighting controls, uh, the ring, the doorbell guys that can alert, you know, so, so that space is already using IOT. Mm-hmm. But, you know, think about who it's, you know, there's data that, that, and data. The big guys love data, yeah. right? You know, yeah. the Googles, the Amazons, the Microsofts, they all love data. So, you know, they, they can push that in, uh, yeah. right? Where, where when you flip that over to, you know, the industrial uh, commercial space too, then you, you start, somebody's got to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody's got to understand it. Somebody's got to maintain it. Um, it's still in its infancy, I, I think. From the industrial standpoint, your your point of AI <laughs> is one of our you know, our CEO's vision is mm-hmm. that all this machine learning, you know, the artificial intelligence, machine learning with this data that we are trying to help pull in to the cloud. That is the real future. That's the real end game, and it's it's really going to transform manufacturing. You know, we talk about Industry 4.0. I'm not a big buzzword guy, <laughs> but you talk about Industry 4.0, and you know all these. Things when you go to an IoT show and everybody's talking about them, um, we're trying to go from the node um, to the gateway to the cloud to fit. Those are the three big pieces that you ha- you have to get the data to you know you have to get the data somewhere, and then you get it to the cloud, and that that's where all the analytics and the real power come. And getting it to the cloud is the data highway that you guys have created. Yeah, that, yeah. that's you know and that's oh, we're just one flavor of it, but yeah, there's that's the other issue too is trying to educate is there's not there's no standard in getting gathering that data. So that that's the hard part right now is people are like all right we get it, what do we do with it? You know and you know is that the right mousetrap for us? So it's a, it's a definite education process, but that that's if you believe everything you read that or at least a fraction you of su- it you're not supposed to <laughs> if you believe a small fraction of what you read it's still it's still in its infancy yeah it still will transform the way manufacturing is, is done. and when i said that you know when i said it it seems like it's been around for longer on the industrial side i think you know what i was referring to is at the at the machine level yeah so you look sure. you look at you know whether it's using optics to track you know, throughput or, you know, if it's other types of automated manufacturing, you know, that stuff's been around for a long time. I think potentially the difference is it's not connected. So it, it's, it's at a local machine level, but it, the data isn't being accumulated in a way that can be understood and potentially made sense of. Right. Yeah. We used to, we came out with the term illuminating dark data, I think was a marketing buzz of ours <laughs> a few, few years ago. And we were talking about lighting as the super highway of data. Um, but if you think about the dark data on a factory floor or even in a you know sports facility what yeah. what are you you know what are you missing that isn't connected to a plc or a robotic system or your backnet system 
there are pieces of equipment that aren't being monitored mm -hmm. and it's it's expensive to try to get those connected and hardwired to you know your your plc backhaul so the idea is to just have these plug and play you know off the shelf sensors that become smart and become part of that information system and you take that you take that data um I joke about all the cell phone photos that are taken now, all that data. <laughs> you use the ones that are good, but you know, back in, in a, uh, my day, you had to care about you know, what you were getting developed, and now, now you just take a, a 10,000 pictures and see what works. It's similar with data. You're bringing all this data back, you're taking those analytics, and you're, you're applying what you've learned from those analytics and, and changing your production. So do you, so you have customers or markets that are they're grabbing the data, they're storing it, for future use so or, or is it just a case where the the sensor infrastructure is there the the data highway is there uh, from there you need some type of server either on-site mm, right, or off-site right. so do you have people that are collecting it knowing that down the road they're gonna be able to make sense of it yeah they're, they're collecting maybe, maybe it. not they're as many as you'd it. like they're using it right i mean you're using it okay immediately um but i think we've had a few proof of concepts um that, that are some of our mcwain factories where they've you know they they've learned things that they didn't even know were happening uh you know just so they they've made immediate changes um but then certainly they can store those you know store the data over time and and you know year over year take take a look at you know this piece this piece of operation versus this piece of operation and make executive changes to the way they're operating those, those areas of the plant cool yeah. well, anything else you'd want to touch on uh, no, no, no? I, I appreciate the yeah, time. Man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very exciting time. I think we're still in its in the infancy of it, and um, yeah, we'll see what the next three, or four, three to five years bring. It's all about making uh, dumb lighting products into <laughs> smart computers, right? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> all right, everything man. will be a computer. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yep.